So I think for us in this world, right, everything's changing. And that's actually a very good thing because I think for whether you're on the media side, whether you're on the agency side, we didn't get into this business to be accountants and every year things change slightly. We got into this business because it's pretty freaking great that everything changes all the time. And here we are, right? We're at this another huge, huge inflection point and the sort of constant stream of like what is working and why. And so I'm gonna talk about really what is the future of the media agency look like and the landscape of programmatic and automation and all these complex things. But really, what's our role? And it's true for all of us, right? What is our role in this pretty interesting and complex world? Has anybody seen this graphic before? This is actually my favorite. So if you see, if you start looking there, it's a little bit like those mall things in the, you know, in the 90s where you'd stand at the kiosk and they're like, just relax your eyes. You're like, I can't see a thing. There's a dog, okay? So there's the dog. Now, here's the crazy thing about this. You can't unsee this, right? So when we talk about marketing, one of my sort of base premises is you can't, the human brain can't become unaware. So if you think about advertising and you think about what we do, if you think about a brand like Coke, once you've had a Coke, you know what it is. Your brain cannot sort of forget what a Coke is. Now, you can cease to care, it doesn't become your, your sort of set of drinks you're selecting, but you cannot become unaware, unaware, and that's true of us here today. So as we talk about all of the things that we're gonna go through and over the next couple of days, Keep your mind open, right? Because once it's opened, it changes form again. This is actually um, a quote I always start with. This is Eric Shinseki, who has had a very long and illustrious military career, um, was just recently bounced out of the VA for terrible management. But either way, his, quotes, <laughs> his quote is excellent. Quote is like, he could be in advertising, right? Where people make terrible decisions all the time. Um, if you dislike change, you're going to dislike irrelevance even more. Right? This is the constant. This underpins everything we do. So every day when you walk into the office, if you're walking in thinking, I know what I'm doing, I got this thing nailed, you're wrong. Change, change, change is the absolute, absolute ca caution. So in terms of talking about the future of the media agency, I thought we should just spend two seconds and look back, right? And do a little bit of the cautionary tale. This is the very first banner that ever ran on the web. 1994, so think the banner is 20 years old. So think about that in the context of millennials, sort of crazy. And so this actually ran, this is the text of it, if you ever clicked your mouse right here, you will. This ran on Wired Magazine for AT&T, Moda Media was the agency that put this out there. AT&T didn't put their logo on it because they weren't sure it was gonna go anywhere and they were a little bit nervous about it. I thought the web was kind of the scary fad. And this idea, right, that we, at Modem and all the early agencies, we were talking about right message, right person, right time. We were gonna take down traditional advertising. Those guys didn't have a clue. And then we filled the web with shit. <laughs> right? This is the site dedicated to Lower My Bills. So if anybody's here who ever worked at Lower My Bills, it's your fault. <laughs> totally your fault. Terrible, terrible, terrible job. And a lot of it is this guy's fault. This is Jesse Wilms. I would totally encourage you guys to read this article. He's called the Dark Lord of the Internet. He's one of the guys that sort of set up those early Ponzi schemes where they, you know, those, the dancing shadow people ads, right, that you sort of, in those early days, were sort of horrified by. This guy actually created those Ponzi schemes of the, you know, here's one quick trip to reduce belly fat, right? By the way, it's entering in your 16-digit credit card number, in case you're wondering what that trick is. And basically what we did, and this is sort of, when you really think about it, you're like, eh, it makes total sense. We ignored what we all learned in eighth grade. So eighth grade economics, if it takes you back a second, we all learned about supply and demand, right? Pretty simple, basic economic principles, similar to gravity. And when we started doing online advertising, we basically said, ah, it doesn't apply. It doesn't, you know, we're gonna create endless inventory. Endless. And we now are sort of surprised that that inventory doesn't demand a lot of value. And so, eh, apparently gravity does apply, right? Supply and demand is the basic premise upon which, if you think about the advertising marketplace, if you think about the inventory marketplace, if you think about media, that we have ignored. And if you follow that line of thinking and you think about the television space, which I'll talk a little bit about, certainly 
the only thing that has propped up television in a world of 50% DVR penetration in the US and Western Europe is limited supply. There are only so many ads that you can buy on The Walking Dead or Breaking Bad or whatever the new show is, right? There's only so many spots. So that's why there's an upfront. And every year, somebody, and I know some of my Digitas friends are here, we're like, why isn't digital have an upfront? Why do you have an upfront when there's unlimited supply? You don't need to have an upfront. So we need to sort of get back to and think about the sort of economic principles that underpin, which is where programmatic and, um, comes in. But ultimately, ultimately, when you think about online advertising, I loved what David said about content. We forgot that we were talking to other people. And this is the real sort of risk and opportunity for us. We are the people on the other end of this advertising. We are those people. And so when we're putting out campaigns and we get wrapped all around the axle when we're talking about programmatic, and we have numerous conversations with clients where nobody actually knows what that means. It's a little bit like having Thanksgiving dinner with your family, and they're like, what the hell do you do? And you're like, ah, it takes too long to explain. Programmatic, <laughs> right? Programmatic is literally just the application of data to inventory to make it more valuable, to reduce the supply. So ultimately, we can deliver messages that actually matter to people. And so this notion of sort of getting really wound in terms of technology and whether it's content, whether it's a film, whether it's a brand campaign, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. What we're actually trying to do is either introduce or convince someone to do something, right? You're just talking to another human being. So this is actually from a presentation. Has anybody here been to a presentation where Singularity University has presented? Yep, I see one. Oh, John, hi, John. Um, Singularity University, if go, like write down this URL and go. Um, this is a university. They're not an accredited university because of um, the, cur the curriculum changes too quickly. But basically, they're affiliated with NASA, and they're tracking. It was founded by Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil, so big names. And they're running curriculums against artificial intelligence, biometrics, sort of all of these things, right? And their presentation about the acceleration of technology is phenomenal, right? So if you look at this inflection point, you look at the Watt engine and railroads, they talk about that that has no sign of abating. And so instead of us sort of wringing our hands and sitting around and saying, technology is moving too fast and, oh, God, I can't possibly keep up, the truth is we better get on the ride, right? The ride is happening. And so this sort of trajectory continues. And so they do unbelievable presentations. And again, I would encourage you to go look at it about sort of studies they're doing around the injections of phosphorescence into cats, right? And they're like, who wants a glow-in-the-dark cat? Like, how scary is that? But actually, the reason why they're doing those studies is that they're trying to design pavement and trees so that you don't need streetlights, so that they'd be phosphorescent, right? And they're sort of looking at the sort of creation, by the way, of the woolly mammoth. Do you know that within a year, we're going to have a woolly mammoth walking the earth? A year. Like, mind-bending, pretty sure we all saw Jurassic Park. Don't know why that didn't sort of sink in, like we probably shouldn't be tinkering around, but either way, this continues, and there is, for all of us in marketing, it's important for us to think about that trajectory, think about what it means for us. All right, most important thing I will say all day, and you will notice the thematic theme underneath this, is that everyone in this room, right, everybody that when you're in these conferences, when we're talking about consumer target or a segment, which is my least favorite way to talk about people, but when we talk about them that way, it is important to remember that everyone just wants to be loved. That's all we want. We want to be heard. We want to be remembered. We want someone to know our name. That's all we want, right? So when we get ourselves into these rooms and marketing and offers and content, and stop. We just want to be loved. And so when I, if you're in a brand, spot and you're sitting in a marketer or you're an agency, it is important for us to remember that when we're delivering something to something, it has to make you feel good. It has to make you feel something. Or honestly, it doesn't really matter. And you're not going to see it anyway. So 
When we talk about the future of media, right? It is starting at your house. And when we talk, you know, I, I think uh, we referenced a little bit about CES this morning, and certainly the notion of a washing machine that talks to your Fitbit. I mean, who knows what the hell is going to go ha happen? But when you think about the future, right, and you think about sort of the connected home, and the scary part about this is we've been talking about it for 15 years, right? We've been talking about the power of it, what it means, and yet I think we've sort of operated under this premise that it's like, well, it's coming, so I don't really have to think about it. And when we as marketers sit in these rooms, no matter what angle we're coming at it from, the truth of it is it's here. And talking about these things as if it's in the future is problematic. And here are the numbers. So I'm just going to do a really quick rundown of sort of the media landscape numbers. Um, and I think it's pretty fascinating. So the first is that TV subscriptions have absolutely plateaued. So last year, there were 1.2 million new households in the US. So that means like first apartments or somebody finally moved out of their parents' basement at the like rape old age of 28. 1.2 million of those, right? Only 225,000 of those people signed up for cable. Holy shit, right? Like you start talking about that plateau of 104 million households, that isn't going to go up. So when we start talking about television, the, the, the landscape starts shrinking. It almost starts looking like landlines, right? You start looking at that, that destruction like a landline. Over the top video, I'm sure everybody's tracking against this, um, will grow, right? As millennials think, I don't need cable. I don't need to pay Comcast $250 a month. I'm going to get Hulu. I'm going to get a Roku. I'm going to get Apple TV. I'm going to sort of collect a collection of stuff. And obviously at CES, right, the announcement of the direct TV relationship with on Sling to show the NFL changes everything, right? Because live sports are one of the sort of last bastions of why you have cable. That's why I still have cable. My husband's like, no way are we getting rid of this if I cannot watch sports, right? So that becomes the last sort of tent pole. The smart TV footprint in the US is exploding, right? So it's expected to rise from 45 million to 78 million. So smart TVs change, they change it, right? They change, you don't have to sort of, even the Chromecast, right? The Google Chromecast where you plug it in. You don't have to do that if you have a smart TV. It becomes very seamless. Again, removing, removing the friction. So you don't need cable. This I love. So this is Vizio, right? Low cost, entry level TVs for you know, first time home buyers. 60% of its TVs that are shipping today are smart. So when you think about that, there is no barrier. So when, again, we're all in these rooms and we're talking about our targets as if they're people different than us, right? That they don't have access to all the technology that we all use to skip ads. I'll get there in a second, but I'm going to call you guys all on that. It changes. Because once you have the ability to do it, you do it. This, I was talking to the um, Gary from EA. We were talking about this this morning. Consoles, right, that are currently driving sort of over the top video content. This is not about playing Call of Duty till 3 o'clock in the morning, or that poor guy in Taiwan who died after playing like five days in a row. This is, which by the way, I do not recommend. Do not recommend. This is about content, right? This is 88 million homes having another device by which they can deliver content. And then finally, when you look at the, app, the landscape of these OTT devices, right? These over-the-top devices, 47 million. So you're looking up over 100% growth. So in this landscape, right, what do we do? What do we do? This, everything changes. If you're just looking at HBO Go, what's the role, right? What's the role of Coca-Cola? What's the role of Chrysler? How do I get to know about those things? And how do I play? All right, can't unsee the dog, right? Know that the dog is there. All right, so the future of media agencies, frankly, media so agencies in general, David said, all brands are media companies. So actually, we could broaden this discussion to be what's the role of a media company if a brand is building their own audience. We believe that the first and most fundamental piece of this is that we have to align with our clients' goals. So if you think about how agencies get paid, when in doubt, follow the money, right? Think about how agencies get paid. We get paid based on FTEs, based on some 
random percentage that's assigned to different media. So we are incented to get our clients to spend more money because we want, it, we want more FTEs. That's the measure, right? So everybody has to continue to spend more money. When you change that, we've changed 50% of our client relationships today have a pay for performance component. And we're very aggressively moving into this. So that when we're sitting in a room together with a client and the client says, well, we have a client that's a QSR chain, their goal is traffic. That's how they're bonused. If we're bonused on any other metric, we have failed. Because we're working at cross purposes. So that notion of how do we align is critically, critically important. And particularly when you start thinking about the programmatic landscape. If programmatic becomes a metric by which we move media, we have to make sure that it makes sense. So do you remember my thing at the beginning, right? We can't just push clients into a place because it drives margin. You have to drive them there because you believe that it works. Experiment relentlessly. I heard the Sapient Nitro was talking about this as well. But fail early and often. And agencies are bad at this. And we're bad at this because we're paid based on an FTE basis. So we want to do things that are proven. We want to do things that continually we know how to do. We have to experiment. And I don't just mean that as an agency. I actually mean that as a collective group. So I'm going to hit this in a minute. But this notion of we need to be trying this stuff out. We were talking in the back actually about Snapchat. How many people are using Snapchat in this room? OK, it's a good smattering. Everybody's talking about it at these marketing things. Who's using it? right? And I appreciate that everybody's 12 that's using it, or some real creepy weirdos. But not the Marriott team. Those are not creepy weirdos. Snapchat is a really complicated and new space. Like You can't talk about it until we're all using it. right? So we have to experiment. You have to try. But you have to be ready to fail. And you have to be ready to fail often. And that requires a tremendous amount of trust between agencies and the client, which helps, by the way, when you're under shared goals. Because they understand that you're trying in order to move the business forward. This is. Um, Everybody's talking about data, right? We'll, we'll talk a lot about it. It relates to content. Everybody's sort of the, the promise of big data. I think there is a very, very important sort of piece here around common sense. So this is actually the screenshot from, have you guys seen About the Data? Anybody signed up for that? OK, another thing to write down and go to today or now, aboutthedata.com. So Axiom, right? world's largest data provider, one of the world's largest data provider who knows everything that you ever bought on your credit card or searched on for Google, launched a site called All About the Data where you can log in all your information. So you have to give it your social security number and things that are a little scary, but the good news is they already know. So you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and you log in, and they tell you everything they know about you. Here's the crazy part. So we are all the people that are buying this data and using it in a programmatic sense or just in a basic research sense, and applying it to our inventory or our clients' buys and making decisions. And when you look at it, when I say use common sense, I went in, I was so excited, because I thought this is the next frontier, right? is that we give people access to manage their own data, as opposed to we holding it in some ivory tower and saying, we'll handle this for you. There's a real power to that. And I went on, because I thought Axiom nailed it. right? And they have my household income is $35,000. Now, I work in advertising and at IPG, so it's not much more. <laughs> but but $35,000. So I get no credit card solicitations, right? I get, n I get no mail. Now, let's, not, let's be clear here. I'm not looking for more mail. Yeah, I'm not changing it. But they have my mortgage. And so unless they're saying I'm a drug dealer, like there's clearly <laughs> like a pretty large gap. Right? So data can be wrong, and often is. And we have not yet gotten good at managing the interconnected pieces. And the second part of this is, of course, Axiom's like, hey, edit this. Oh, no, no. What? So you make more money selling my more accurate data? I don't think so. So we haven't yet gotten that value exchange right. So when we're talking about data, and when you get into these rooms, and there's lots of excitement around all of these decisions that we're going to make based on this data, just be mindful of the fact that we have not yet cracked it. We have not yet cracked it. There's a company called Palantir that's out on the West Coast. 
that's doing a pretty unbelievable job of starting to knit together these things. But I think that our using data, but make sure we use it with a heavy dose of skepticism and common sense. This is the second to last piece of this, but I think we need to, t we talk to people, right? We're all in focus groups and we all sort of go into those rooms and tell people, I'm sure um, Marriott probably had some conversations with people around two bellmen, and we've all been in those rooms. But I think we have to also be skeptical. So this is actually um, a painting that was done by a group of focus group participants who were charged with creating the most beautiful painting in the world. Now, as you see here, there's nothing offensive about this, right? It could easily be on a hotel wall. Not a, not a hotel as nice as this one, but certainly this could be hanging behind a hotel wall. But as you see there, it's pretty random, right? So somebody was like, we need history. So there's like George Washington. Okay, random. And somebody was like, well, art has to contain and represent family. So you've got a modern day family walking there. And then my favorite are the Jesus deer walking on the water, apparently. <laughs> not sure why, but they're there, right? People cannot create great art. They cannot create great art together. So when we ask people and we talk about what's the role of an agency, the role of the agency, whether it's creative or media, and as we all move towards this nexus point around content, it is around the creation of something that moves you. This doesn't move you. It doesn't offend you, right? If you think about most advertising today, it doesn't offend you. But does it inspire you? Does it make you laugh? Does it make you want to talk about it? No, because it's this. Right? So when we talk to people and ask them what we want, sometimes they can't tell us, and we have to be careful of that. And then finally, even though I hate the word consumer and we're starting a company-wide push to make sure we remove this word from our lexicon, I think it's important here, you are the people you're marketing to. So every time I'm in these rooms, right, and it happens if I'm in an internal room at Media Brands or we're talking to clients, we spend a ton of money on television. A ton. And I always ask, who's watching TV? Who in this room watches things end to end? Right? There's a few. Not very many. Unless it's a tentpole event like the Oscars last night, right? Where you're sitting and you're sitting through it and you can't fast forward or you can't record it later because you'll know everything on Twitter anyway. So if we're not using the media that we're selling, that's a problem. We're the sort of canaries in the coal mine. And by the way, this isn't a TV problem. If you think about banners, what's the last banner you clicked on or even noticed, right? I, I always talk about if there was a banner running at the cross, top of the page that said, Liz Ross, click here, $50,000, no strings attached, I wouldn't even see it. I wouldn't. And so the question becomes for us as marketers that we have to think about ourselves and in the early days, right, when I first started out in my career, I remember being in rooms and people saying, hey, don't confuse yourself. Don't confuse yourself with the consumer. You are not the target. Okay, fair enough. But now we've done such an enormous job of divorcing ourselves with what we do and who we are as people that we've lost our way a little bit. We've lost our way. Last quote. This is Alvin Toffler. He's a futurist. And what he talks about is that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So every time you get the update, right, the Apple OS on your iPhone is like, update your new software, and you're like, oh, for the love of, like I just figured out where everything was. That's literacy. That's literacy. And that's that change, right? That's that comfort with change. And so that underpinning, when we think about marketing, is to make sure that we're not moving too slow and that we're not sort of missing, that we're not missing the big stuff and that we are connecting with actual people with messages that matter. Thank you. <laughs>